All right. Hey, we are glad that you are with us today. My name is Mark Porter. I'm the executive pastor here. If I have not met you, I would love to meet you after the service. And we are in this series called Follow, What is a Disciple of Jesus? And basically, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And uh, that's kind of what we're called to do if we are a follower of Jesus, is to go and make disciples of all nations. And our working definition has been this. A disciple is an apprentice of Jesus who becomes like Jesus. And the reason we've defined it is because when you, we use the word disciple, a lot of different things may come to mind. You may think of 12 guys sitting around a table together having a meal, but you are a disciple of something. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And here's a few of the things we've discussed during this series. This is kind of a summary. Um, we've talked about being an apprentice of Jesus. A disciple obeys Jesus. Boy, we love that word, right? Obey, right? Basically, obey is to trust that his commands, his promises, his precepts are uh, worthy of following. And to trust means to relinquish control and follow him. A disciple bears fruit. And Clay Thomas, our worship pastor, taught a couple weeks ago, he asked a great question. What fruit is God producing in you? And the only way you can produce fruit is to be connected to the true vine. So what's being produced in you? And then last week, Doug talked about this. You've got to surrender everything to follow Jesus. And his follow-up to that was because anything can derail you from following Jesus. Anything. And here's the thing I want to challenge you with this morning. You are being discipled by something. Something is discipling you. Something is influencing you. And that's why we have to surrender everything to follow him. What is shaping you? What are you being discipled by? Jesus invites us to follow him. And today we're going to talk about this other aspect of discipleship. In John 13, 34, Jesus says this at the Last Supper. He says this to his disciples, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now here's the problem with this verse. You've all heard it. We're familiar with it. Even if you didn't grow up in church, I bet you've heard, love one another, right? If it wasn't Jesus who was being quoted, it was Mickey Mouse or somebody like that, right? Like, we know this. And yet, this was revolutionary. Jesus said, a new command. And I wonder if the disciples paused and said, hey, he's got something new. Get out your spirals. Get out your, your you know, your pens. We're going to write it down. And then he says, love one another. It was a new command, but it wasn't a new command. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Leviticus, the Levitical laws, Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. So I don't know if the disciples were like, hey, does he know it's not new? But it was new. Because Jesus uses a new standard. As I have loved you. The word new is used four times in the New Testament. Or this word new that we translate new in the Greek, this particular word is used four times in the New Testament, all by the Apostle John, and all in relation to this word love. Agape love. Here's what new means. A new kind of unprecedented, uncommon, unheard of love. It is fresh. It's new. It is which recently made superior to what it perceived. See, you're not to love your neighbor as yourself. You're to love your neighbor as I have loved you. Jesus creates a new standard. And he says, love is not a feeling. It's not a desire. It's not, hey, I love ice cream or even I love my family. It is an unconditional, unprecedented, superior kind of love. It's a love of choice of action. And often what Jesus does 
And it's exactly what he did here, because this is the Last Supper. Is he gives a command. Love one another as I have loved you. Let's look at that verse again, John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Now what we all know in this room is that the cross is coming for Jesus. That he loves us so much he will die on the cross. It's what we celebrated through communion, what we sang about. That he died for us, that he loved us that much, but the disciples don't know that yet. So why would he say, as I have loved you? What Jesus often did was he made a point, but he illustrated the point before he made the point. And so we have to go back to the first part of John 13, because Jesus does something that is so lost on us in our culture that we just blow right by it. He does something that has really no cultural context for us today, and so it's going to be hard for me to explain. I'm going to try and explain to you. But what he did was so like, <gasps> jaws hit the floor kind of thing, that it was shocking to his disciples. What he does in John 13 at the very first is he washes the disciples' feet. And foot washing was commonplace in this day and time. Greco-Roman accounts of it. There's, uh, there's Judeo uh, accounts of it. And, and the reason was is roads back then were not asphalt, right? They were dusty. They were dirty. They were filled with human and animal waste. Plumbing wasn't a thing, right? And even as, if you look back, even in the Old Testament, we see that foot washing was done as a form of hospitality. By Jesus' day and time, it was pretty commonplace to wash someone's foot at, feet if they showed up at your house. But here's the thing. It was considered such a degrading and menial task that it was given to the lowest possible servants ever. So in some Greek, I'm sorry, in some Jewish text, it says that Jewish slaves are prohibited from washing someone's feet because it was considered that subservient, that it was reserved for the Gentile slaves. There was a social hierarchy, a social ranking here. And Jesus was in a position of authority. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. And up until this point, now this is where I don't want you to miss this. There's absolutely no instance. There is no recorded instance of someone in a higher position of social status washing the feet of someone in a lower status. Ever. Until Jesus did it. And it would have been shocking for his disciples. It was a degrading task. So let's look at it. Verse 1 of chapter 13 says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Then... Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Let me stop there for just a second. Jesus realized he had power, authority, kingship, if you will, lordship. He really deserved to have his feet washed because he was in a position of power and authority and leadership. And yet he used his power, authority, leadership to serve. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. It's lost on us. I don't know what the modern-day equivalent would be. If the Pope showed up at your house and cleaned your toilets, I don't know. But it was shocking for someone of higher social status to do this. What's interesting is that in John's account of the Last Supper, he doesn't record communion like all the other Gospels, but he records this. It was significant. 
And, and it was customary during that time, like I said, as a form of hospitality. If you had a slave and you showed up at somebody's house and they had a slave, they could wash your feet when, right before you came in the door. But there's no instances of doing it during the meal. And most scholars believe the reason Jesus did this was, again, to take something and to turn it on its head. Because he was communing, communi communicating more than hospitality. He was communicating, first of all, the way we love one another is to serve one another humbly. Jesus takes a custom and tradition that is so very familiar to these guys, and he just flips it on its head. And we should pay attention. He was so certain of his relationship with his heavenly father. He was so certain of his, of his identity and his destiny and his purpose that he could serve humbly. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for a ransom for many. When we serve humbly, basically it doesn't mean that we would do everything, but that we would be willing to do anything. Let me say that again. It doesn't mean you do everything, but it means that you would be willing to do anything to communicate God's love to someone else. Let me just stop for just a second. The reason the early church exploded, the reason the early church grew and flourished, under enormous oppression in the Roman world by, by, uh, by the Jews of, the, of that day was because they took Jesus' command to love one another and lived it out. And it has the same ramifications for us today. Look what happens next, verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing but later you will understand. See, what he's saying here is like, hey, this foot washing thing, it's just a prelude. It's just a preview. It's just the foreshadowing to the cross. Because I'm going to serve you on the cross, and I'm going to cleanse you on the cross. I'm going to forgive you on the cross. Look, look what he says. Later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered. Let me back up just a second. Peter was indignant. Again, his jaw would have been on the floor. There was no precedent for this. You know what there was precedent for? When someone's feet were already washed, there was a, sometimes a symbolic ceremony where, uh, the, where, a disciple, where disciples of a rabbi would wash his feet as a sign of devotion and love, of willingness to follow that rabbi. But there was zero until this point, there was never, ever, ever, ever an instance where a rabbi stooped down and washed the feet of his followers. Pay attention to that. We are called to serve humbly. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, and the whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked. That's the question for us, too. Do we understand what he has done for us? Jesus was not just giving a sermon on humble service. It was much more than that. He was cleansing. He was communicating forgiveness. He was foreshadowing what he would do on the cross. 
in this day and time, the hands and the feet were considered kind of the, the human part of the body. And that priests and religious leaders of the day and time, before they could do any religious acts, they had to wash their hands and their feet. It was a way of kind of cleansing away the sins of the day that were committed by the human part of the body. And what Jesus does is he steps down and he serves humbly. And then he forgives freely. To communicate what was about to happen. He humbles himself and serves. He forgives and he sacrifices. And the question for us and the question for the disciples that day was, do you understand what I have done for you? See, when we understand how much we have been served and how much we are loved, how much we have been forgiven, the songs that we sing, when we believe that to be true, it should change us. And only when we get how great we are loved can we truly love out of that love, that unconditional agape, not a love of, hey, I feel like loving you, but a love of obedience, of trust, of abiding. This is a huge question. We have got to wrestle with this. We have got to get this, how much we are loved and sacrificed and forgiven and cleansed and served. Do I realize how dirty and diseased And unsanitary, my heart is. My life is. My choices are. And that Jesus would not say, hey, get yourself cleaned up and then I'll cleanse you. No, he stoops down into the dirty, smelly nastiness of our world and our hearts and serves and forgives and sacrifices. Do we understand how much has been done for us? Look what happens next, verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, you, your, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. This wasn't literal. This was more metaphorical of what he's communicating, service. Forgiveness. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Disciples, do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, no messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I have set an example for you. The word example here means, in the Greek, means to imitate or copy or replicate an action. We are called to love as Jesus loved. Disciples love others like Jesus loved others. Through humble service, for, through freely forgiving. He says, I have set an example. He washed their feet, and we know the cross is the ultimate sacrifice of service of forgiveness the disciples didn't know that yet but he says I imitate imitate me copy me and then this word in the Greek the word do in the Greek is really cool it means do it doesn't say when you feel like it when someone hurts you when you have a grudge it just says do it What would it be like? How different would our world be, our church be, our communities, our families, if we really acted like this? Not when we felt like it, but realizing how much we have been served, how much we have been loved, how much we have been forgiven and cleansed and did the same. To serve someone else humbly, not wanting something in response or expecting something in response, just to do it, to communicate love that you have received. Or to forgive someone who does not deserve to be forgiven. How different would it be? What 
What if this was true of us? This is why the early church exploded and grew and thrived because they loved each other well in mutual submission, but they loved people outside the church well. And people were like, I got to get some of that. What if they said that about Live Oak Community Church? What if they said, well, the teaching's not that great, but man, they love each other really great. What if that was true of us? What if they said, man, they love each other well. Serve each other well. Forgive each other. One more way, and this is, this is called the farewell discourse of Jesus, starting in chapter 13. In chapter 15, Jesus restates this command. He says this. Let me, ask, let me stop real quick. You know how you repeat something to your kids because it's really important? You know how you repeat something to your kids when it's really important? Do you know how you repeat something to your kids when it's really important? Jesus must have thought this was really important. For us, his kids, his followers, his disciples to get. My command is this. Love each other. We know it. We've heard it so many times. We just blow right past it. Oh, yeah, I love people. Love each other. There's the standard. Here's the new. Here's the unprecedented. As I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. They lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You're not a servant. You're a friend of Jesus. And when you hang out with Jesus, you're going to love like Jesus loves. And he says, serve humbly, forgive freely. And the third aspect that he highlights here is to lay down one's life. The disciples don't know this yet, but he's going to go to the cross and literally lay down his life for you, for me, for the disciple. And sacrifice and die so that he, we can be cleansed and forgiven and served through his death and resurrection. Here's what's interesting about this. One of the translations of lay down one's life is to bow down. That's a gut punch for me. Lay down, I'm like, yeah, I'll take a bullet, you know, whatever. No, 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 no. Bow down. Set aside your agenda, your comfort, your finances, your relationships, and put him first. Love the way you were loved. Your desires. What would it look like in your life today, financially, relationally, sexually, whatever, to bow down, to serve humbly, to forgive freely? These are the three aspects that Jesus talks about. When he says love one another, this is what he's communicating. To serve humbly, forgive freely, and to lay down one's life. That's what we're called to imitate as disciples of Jesus, of followers of Jesus. And as Clay said a couple weeks ago, this is the fruit we should be producing when we're connected to the true vine who served us, forgave us, and laid down his life for us. And I know what you're thinking. This is really hard. Yep, that's what I'm thinking too. Think about this. How hard was it for Jesus that night? How hard was it for Jesus, period, to love his disciples? Jesus stoops down and communicates the foreshadowing through the cross to his disciples, washes their feet, humbly serving them, cleansing them, knowing that one would betray him, they would all deny, or one would deny him, they would all abandon him, desert him, reject him. In the next hours, they would display ignorance, laziness, selfishness, and just a general lack of trust. But Jesus' love for his disciples, for you and for me, is not dependent upon our response, but upon his connection to the Heavenly Father. When we love this way, it's not based on how someone responds, but on based on who we are connected to and what we have received. 1 John 4.11 says this, 
Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There it is again. We know the verse. We've heard it. And yet it is a hard, high teaching. And what we really need to understand is what he said. The thing we need to wrestle with today, I think, is what he said in verse 13, or 13 verse 12. Do you understand what I have done for you? How you have been served and cleansed and a life laid down on your behalf. When we understand the weightiness of that, the heaviness of that, what has been lavished on us, Jesus didn't say, hey, get cleaned up and then come to me. He just came into the muck and the mire and the poop of our world and cleansed us. Don't tweet that out, okay? But it's true. What does it say that Jesus would serve us? Forgive us. Lay down his life for us. In our uncleanness. In our dirtiness. In our unbelief. He didn't probably feel like loving his disciples. But he loved them in word and action. And we are called to do the same. Jesus knows our failures, our worst indiscretions, our selfish and dirty hearts, our fears, our general lack of trust. Our want for control, yet he willingly serves us, forgives us, and lays down his life for us. I know what you're thinking. You're like, yeah, but can that really happen, Mark? It just sounds like, I don't know, something a preacher would say on a Sunday morning. That doesn't really work. I want to read a story to you. Some of you may have heard of this person. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. Corey was a Dutch watchmaker, later a writer. She worked with her father, uh, her sister, and other family members to help the Jews escape the Holocaust during World War II. Her family was ultimately discovered and sent to concentration camps. Corey barely survived until the end of the war, and all the members of her family died in concentration camps. Seared by this terrible trial by fire, Corey's faith in God survived. And she spent much of her time in the post-war years traveling Germany, elsewhere in Europe, sharing her faith in Christ. On one occasion in 1947, while speaking at a church in Munich, she noticed a balding man in a gray overcoat near the rear of the basement room where she was. She had been speaking on the subject of God's forgiveness and love. But her heart froze within her when she recognized the man. She could picture him as, he, as she had seen him so many times before in his blue Nazi uniform and his visored cap. The cruelest of the guards at Ravensbrück camp. Where Corey had suffered some of the most horrible indignities. And where her own sister had died days before Corey's release. Yet here he was at the end of her talk, coming up the aisle toward her with his hand thrust out. Thank you for your fine message, he said. How wonderful it is to know that all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Yes, Corey had said that. She had spoken so easily of God's forgiveness. But here was a man whom she despised and condemned with every fiber of her being. She couldn't take his hand. She couldn't extend forgiveness to this Nazi oppressor. She realized this man didn't remember her. Remember her. How could he? in a prison camp of thousands. You mentioned Ravensbrook, the man continued, his hand still extended. I was a guard there. I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's true. But since then, I've come to know Jesus. It's been hard for me to forgive myself for all the cruel things I did, but I know that God has forgiven me. And please, if you would, I would like to hear from you, from your lips, that God has forgiven me. This is Corey's response out of her book. I stood there. I, whose sins had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but for me it seemed hours 
as I wrestled with the most, dif most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. It was simple and horrible as that. And still I stood there. The coldness clutching my heart and I woodenly and mechanically thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then the healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. Listen to what she says. Don't miss this. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. See, when we love as Jesus loves, sure it does something for somebody else. But it does something in us because we were created to love like this. When we forgive, when they don't deserve forgiveness, and when we lay down our lives and put aside our agenda, we will experience love so intensely. See, we most experience God's love when we extend that love that he has poured into us. We most experience God's love when we extend the love of God that he has poured into us. Corey says this, it is not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. What would it be like to serve, to forgive, to sacrifice out of that deep, love and connection to God. We most experience the love of God when we extend the love of God he has poured into us. That's why we're called to serve, to forgive, and to lay down our lives for one another. And it changed the world. And it changes us. Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the weight of your love, your service, your forgiveness, your life for mine, for each of us, so heavy and weighty and wonderful. Help us to not take it for granted. Help us to serve out of that love, out of to forgive out of that love, to lay down our agendas for that love, with that love in us. We most experience your love when we extend that love to others. And it is so very wonderful. Thank you for Jesus and his love for us. We pray all this in his name. Amen.